I am Tim Olson. I am not that Timothy Olson, uh, but I'm very hopeful that my Google results will be mixed a little bit between us now, so I can be like, yeah, I am that guy. Uh, so I am. I do uh, work here at KQED on partnerships, and one of my pleasures is to be able to work on partnerships with uh, Vince and the Media Impact Fund team. Uh, and we're just so glad you're here. Um, you are all working on changing media for good in some way, and boy, do we need it. I mean, as you all know from your personal life and your professional life, we're awash in short, you know, in tweets and flame wars, in media that's really uh, for the limbic brain and not to nourish humanity. Uh, but here we today, we are seeing all the, ex you're experiencing all of these amazing journalists, storytellers, who are really uh, pushing against the sort of commercial model that really is all about engagement as opposed to really building up humanity. And uh, one of the transitions we're doing here is talking about the different mediums. And now we're going to talk about journalism in the morning. Now we're talking about storytelling. And in particular, we're going to bring on a few amazing podcasters. How many of you are listening to podcasts? As you can see, they have grown a ton uh, in the last decade or so to become really a mainstream media choice for uh, large parts of the world. Uh, and they are particularly effective in telling stories from the heart. Uh, in the public radio space, in the audio space, we talk about painting pictures in someone's mind. Really, it's a really intimate medium. And if you look at the stats, people who listen to podcasts listen to a lot of podcasts listen to the entire things, even long form podcasts, whereas like on our phones, we're just fleeting by so many stories. But when you're immersed in a podcast, you're really immersed. Uh, most people who start a podcast go to the full completion of the podcast. Uh, and it is a really unique medium for like building community. You'll hear from the folks that you're gonna, we're gonna bring on stage how the people who are in the stories are a part of the stories, telling the stories from their own first person point of view. And so uh, it's my pleasure. I've been talking to several of them. We're going to uh, first bring up uh, Erlan and Nigel, but I'm going to tell you about uh, the guest that's coming after. That's Ana Yatsi Diaz Cortez. Uh, you've heard Reveal talked about today from the Center for Investigative Report. Ana Yatsi has done a series for them that was distributed by Reveal and PRX uh, on the mur murder of 43 Mexican students and the connection of that story to the American drug war. So it's an incredible podcast. I encourage you to listen to it. It's called After Ayotzinapa. Uh, but first, uh, I get to bring to the stage uh, our pals who are uh, Erlan and Nigel. Erlan and Nigel uh, produce Ear Hustle, and they co-founded that. Who listens to Ear Hustle? Hey, I figured. For those that didn't raise your hand, you, you got a treat. You're going to, I'm sure, listen to it afterwards. It uh, tells the stories of people uh, in prison and at, out of prison and their lives from the first person point of view. They also happen to work out of KQED, so I get to hang out with them and draw and, do all, and have snacks and everything else. So, a big round of applause to Nigel and Erlon. I think this one. Oh, this one. No. Anyway, okay. Hi. This is not our, these are not our images. Okay. Hi, I'm Nigel Poor. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Erlon Woods. And Ear Hustle came to be while I was serving a life sentence at San Quentin State Prison. And Nigel was a volunteer at San Quentin. Yes, and neither of us knew a lot about audio, but we wanted to see what it would be like to tell the stories of the men's lives inside prison. Initially, our idea was to make a radio program just for the prison, but that idea grew and it became a podcast that has since today been downloaded over like 70 million times. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. So I said that we didn't know a lot about creating audio, but we knew right away that we didn't want to tell stories about crime. We wanted to tell stories about everyday life inside prison and also think about the connections between life inside prison and life outside prison. So what we want to do today is to share a few audio clips with you to give you a really full idea of what an Ear Hustle episode sounds like and what our ideas are about. So 
The first clip is from our first season, uh, and it's an episode we did that illustrates what every ear hustle story is. Yes, and every ear hustle story has three components. One, Erlon and I are the narrators who escort you through the story. Erlon is the voice of someone who's been incarcerated, and my voice is someone from the outside. And all of our stories have varying emotions. That's very important to us. So you'll find yourself laughing, being surprised, having questions, and then also experiencing um, very difficult stories that are quite emotional. The third thing that all of our stories have um, is careful attention to sound design. We use music to help sculpt the stories and to also help escort the listener through the experience of listening. And this comes from our first season, uh, a guy named Roach who loves critters and he shows, you know, what giving love inside of a prison is like. You know, actually, doesn't he have a whole collection of snails? He has himself? a gang of snails, yes. gang of critters, gang of pets. He, you wouldn't want to be a celly. I saw him one time and <laughs> he took his hat off and he had a pray mantis under it. Yeah. <laughs> So we would say, when y'all listen to this clip, please close your eyes and just let it settle in. Yeah, let it settle up. This is about two minutes, and if you could play the first clip. So how would you describe him? To me, I think Roach looked like the original Jesus Christ. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he got the dreadlocks. Uh, he looked like he's from the earth. And if he could, he'd probably just be wearing a leaf. And he got this one little thing that he do. He'll just start sniffing on his dreadlocks. I know I've seen him do that. He grabs his hair and he pulls it in front of his nose and just sniffs. Why are you whispering? Because I feel like I'm talking about him behind his back. <laughs> <laughs> he knows he does it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's but, not like he's going to no, hear this and he, go, oh my God, no. I sniff my hair? Hey, he'll catch himself and you just be looking at him, he like, uh. <laughs> FYI. I do smell my dreads. I put different oil on each one of them. They smell good. They smell like I just came out the dirt, hanging out with roots and stuff. But you know what, though? When people from the outside look at Roach, they be like, oh, dude, weird, man, I ain't talking to dude. But Roach is a cool dude. My name is Renell Draper, but I go by Roach. My relationship with people is pretty strained. I don't trust them. From early on, they, they have been a source of pain for me. So Roach is about 40 years old, and he's a pretty shy guy. Until you know him. When I was a child, before I was removed from the care of my mom's custody, she tried to drown me a couple times in the tub. And then she stopped, and she left the bathroom, and she was crying. I, I knew she was unhappy or sad at something I did. I wanted to actually comfort her, but I, I didn't know how to do it. I don't remember her face, and I haven't seen her since. So one of the things that we really love about podcasting is that it allows us to work really creatively with sound design, which is one of the three components I mentioned. It helps create an oral experience for the listener. And you notice in that clip, it started very lighthearted and we're having a good time. And then all of it, then, then there's this um, shift in tone and sound and you get that the, the dripping water and it creates this feeling of a very dark, empty space. And that's a way to prepare the listener for something really difficult that's about to come, which is learning what happened to Roach, but also the way he ends by saying he's never seen his mother again, and he doesn't even remember her face, which is you know the complete erasure of a person from your life. And that was the early episode. That was when I was still inside San Quentin. And uh, it was a trip. I really couldn't see the success of the podcast from inside. So we used to have a lot of our listeners that used to send in a lot of mail. And <laughs> she used to bring it in. And that would basically tell us, like, where we were at. You yes. Know? Yeah. We got a ton of mail. And, and I'm not kidding. Like, we get mail bins full of mail, which is really exciting. And it's, it's amazing to see um, the impact that the stories have on listeners. And in fact, uh, this afternoon, we're going to be giving a talk on the floor right above um, at 345. And we've brought in all of the mail that we've received over time. It's 21 by all, well, almost all of it, 21 binders. So if you're interested, um, please come to that panel. 
I remember when we were in season two, we were doing a story, it was about parenthood, and Nigel had brought some of the mail in, and we had went to the back and just grabbed one of them, and we gave it to a guy who we were talking to and just told him to read it. We didn't tell him why, we just told him to read it. And he was a father himself. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay, can we play the next clip, please? Okay, this is a letter, it looks like from a, a youngster named Jalen. It says, my name is Jalen. My dad is in prison. I'm nine, nine and a half years old. I re really like listening to your podcast. Oh. My dad does not write me a lot now. Can I get him to write me more? Please, please write back. Thanks, Jalen. P.S. Can you share this or one of your podcasts, please? So, so reading that, like, what do you get? Like, what was, what is your advice to oh, him? Oh man, I've got tears in my eyes and something in my throat right now. Jalen, if you're listening in now, my heart goes out to you, little one. I don't know what is in your dad's heart. Um, wherever he is in this system, uh, there are a lot of pressures on him. Please don't stop. Please. Your letter says that he does not write to you a lot, so that's telling me that he does write you some. So the caring is there. Dig, on, dig deep into that little heart and soul of yours and, and try to find the best words you can to let your dad know how important staying in contact with him is to you, how much you love the letters that you do get, how much you get out of them. And I bet you your letters are going to make him understand how important whatever he has to say is in your life. What a great letter, Jalen. Keep it up. Please, please. So I remember when we got that, we were all so struck that a nine-year-old found it, found a way to reach out to strangers to ask for help and to get something that his father wasn't able to give him. And it, was, it felt really wonderful to be able to get him an answer, even if it wasn't from his father. And so this was just another signif signifier of the way that Ear Hustle was reaching out into the world and um, affecting people in unlikely places. And we wanted to go to women's prison. Yes. So I will say this. Um, we, I knew that there was a lot of deep stories inside of women's prisons because I communicated with a few through mail. And since we were like in a men's prison, we couldn't just go to the women's prison. Exactly. And so in 2018, in 19. 2000 something. 2019, when, er when Erlang got out of prison, we were finally, yes, we were finally yes, yes. able to do that. But it's not like you can just show up at a prison with your microphone and say, please let me come in and do stories. Um, it, it literally takes years to develop a relationship one with the administration to get permission to go in there, but also with the people who are incarcerated there so they feel comfortable sharing stories with you. But finally, not long ago, we were able to do this at the California Institution for Women, which is in Southern California. And by adding women's voices to, this, to our project, we've really been able to change the kinds of stories that we tell. Right, and in the interview that you're about to hear, um, we're talking to a woman named Karen and we were just there to talk about her experience of helping her cellmate give birth in a cell. Yes, yes. And so in this clip, one of the things you're gonna hear is that the, the really surprising turn an interview can take if you are actually in front of that person listening carefully. Um, so next clip, please. Just curious, how do you grapple, or is that the word? How do you grapple with a life sentence? Oh, that's a, that's a, oh, that's a much different story. I'm kind of different in, in my, the reasoning behind. Um, I'm here for gross vehicular manslaughter, and um, it was, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it was um, 
my nine-year-old daughter that was killed. And at the time, all I wanted to do was die. For me, being sentenced to life um, was kind of some weird poetic justice. That's how I felt about it. I wanted nothing more than for my daughter to be okay and to live, and here I am sentenced to life. I thought with my addiction that it would kill me and that would be the worst thing that could possibly happen. And it's so far from the worst thing that could possibly happen. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that. I don't know how, do we want to get into this or not? I mean, I know it's off topic. Yeah. I don't think this comes across on the tape, but when she said that, I was so unprepared. I, right, I was trying right. to stall for time. I actually turned <laughs> to our editor and was like mouthing, what do we do? Yeah, those be hard moments. Like, what is the next question? Because you wasn't really, it just throws you. Oh, my you. God. And Erlon, it happened so fast. Yeah. You know, that's what, it, it, it's kind of interesting what happens when you go into an interview and you think one thing is going to happen. And then you're told something that is so painful and raw. Right. And gut-wrenching and but you still have to be there and, and do the interview right oh i was so glad i wasn't there alone definitely so hearing that story we knew that we wanted to do more work inside of the california institution for women and we want our, well our next big push right now is setting up the same type of studio that we have inside san quentin so we'll be able to go there and do in-person uh interviews and teach the women there how to basically do it themselves so they can get more of their voices out. Definitely. Over how many? 11. Over 11. Oh. I was going to say 11 million seasons. <laughs> Over 11 like seasons, it. it has been very gratifying to see the impact that Ear Hustle have with its listeners. Yes, and our work is really about trying to inspire other people. And I always feel like one of the best ways to know if a project is working is by the way it inspires other people to get into their creativity. So we just wanted to share some of the wonderful things our listeners has, have sent us. So the beautiful Afghan that was made by a woman named Lucy, um, the little uh, sculpture of our logo. For some reason, Erlon said one day that he wanted to see the Queen of England in an Ear Hustle t-shirt drinking a cup of tea. I've never seen tea. her in a t-shirt before. <laughs> yeah, I don't think she ever wore a tea. Um, and a listener made this beautiful wa watercolor. And then, of course, this nail art, which I think is fantastic. Everyone loves wearable art. i got to watch what I say on the show. <laughs> Definitely watch what you say. So uh, we're running out of time. OK, we're going to get to this so, last one. But we're going to leave you uh, with this one last clip. It was a story that we did from San Quentin Death Row. And it was an episode about uh, if you're on Death Row, uh, how does Death Row affect your five senses? Yes, and we asked Steve Champion, who at that time had been on Death Row for 38 years, um, what the meaning of life is, or how to find meaning in life. That's not. Play the audio. Yeah, play the audio, but don't look at this picture. <laughs> The do, last, do we, we play the last audio, please? No, you don't have the last audio? You don't have audio? the last audio? Well. Okay, well, you'll have to come to our panel at 345 <laughs> because I'm telling you, it is the most beautiful 33 seconds of audio, and I really want to share it with you. So I'm sorry that we don't have it, but thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Do you need to see? Test one, two. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Ana Yancy Diaz-Cortez, and I'm um, a senior reporter and producer at Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX. And I have just a question for all of you tonight. I can't really see, but I'll try. Of how many of you here have heard about the Ayotzinapa case, just out of curiosity? Good. I see a fair amount of hands in the air. So I wanted to just start with that to um, 
tell you that as some of you who heard this case that had, you know, who heard the story in 2014, when this news broke about the disappearance of 43 young college students in um, the city of Iguala Guerrero, a state in Mexico, it was shocking. I was in LA, which is predominantly a very Mexican and Central American city, and it just really, sh a Latin American city, and it shook the city and a lot of us in the US. I was working in public radio at the time in a newsroom where, you know, everyone and their mom was covering the story. And I remember, you know, just like, you know, talking to my editor and being like, public radio has to be there. We have to tell this story. At the time, I had two little kids. I followed obsessively, you know, on my phone and cut to four years later coming to reveal. I remember being like, this is the place where I can do this kind of long form investigative work. And it was really like one of the first stories I pitched. And, you know, basically I'm here to tell you that, you know, you need to care because for a while, um, you know, as, as producers or reporters in this room or in this building and all of you here, we know the daily grind of like a weekly show or a daily news show. And it's really hard to do kind of these long form investigations. And if you know anything about this case, you know that it's like an impossible case to follow, especially remotely on your phone. And, you know, that leads me to a woman named Kate Doyle, who, if you're a Latin Americanist in any way, you'll know she's like a legend in this world of archive and invest in human rights investigations. And she works for this organization called the National Security Archive. We'd collaborated in the past, and she said, I want to do a podcast on Ayotzinapa. And I was like, well, I've been pitching this story for two years. What do you have? And even in that first conversation, um, we both realized that two things, that one, we, we wanted to tell a story. And the best form to do that was a radio podcast form because it was a story. It needed that narrative for it to gel because it was such a confusing, confusing case. And two, we wanted to tell the story about the investigation. But in order to do that, we needed to tell the story of the night, right? The night of the crime. So just to set up briefly the first clip, I'm going to play you. Um, it was the night of September 26, 2014. There was busloads of about 70 young college students um, snaking their way through a city, a town called Iguala in Guerrero. They were on their way back to campus when suddenly they're stopped by police for, um, they're stopped by police and suddenly there's gunfire. Um, by the end of the night, 43 of these young men were taken off buses and, and disappeared. Um, it's now been eight and a half years and um, basically without a trace. Six people died by the end of that night. And, um, and suddenly we're in 2019 convincing editors why this should matter to a US audience. And in order to do that, we had to tell the story of the night. So this was our attempt um, to tell that story. If you could play the first clip, please. They didn't want us at all. They just got down and, and started shooting, shooting to kill. One of our compañeros tried to get out and, and do something to move the police cars, and, and that's when the first one of us was shot. I saw my compañero on the ground, lying in a pool of blood, convulsing, and, and the, the police just never stopped shooting. I was taking cover near a broken window. It was totally busted, but I could peek through. I, I saw two cops pointing at us, and then I saw a bunch of compañeros. They had already been arrested, but they continued to shoot, and, and all of us continued to shout. So that's a one-minute clip. Um, you know, we took many more minutes to, to tell that story. But why I'm bringing this clip um, to you today is because there's, there's two elements there, right? It's, it's tape, what we call tape in radio. It's tape in, in Spanish, right, brought to life by voiceover and by actors, by working with people. But it was so important to us. So in, you know, in traditional journalism, your editor would tell you you have to go back to those two survivors that spoke to us. We use pseudonyms because they've been harassed so much for telling their story. You have to go back to them and ask them to tell their story for you, for your story. 
working alongside Kate Doyle in this material comes from actually an American journalist named John Gibbler, who was there, who we partnered with, and he was there in the days after the attack interviewing all the families and all the survivors. And his reporting is part of a book and an oral history, but it became a forensic kind of map for the investigation that came later on. And alongside him and Kate Doyle, they were basically like, you do not re-traumatize survivors for a podcast story. <laughs> the reason to talk to people is, you know, to get their testimony to bring down a dictatorship in this, in this sense. So it was kind of a paradigm shift for me as a reporter and a journalist doing this work to be like, what material does exist that as a radio producer and a podcast person is in first person, they can bring a U.S. audience in that knows little about the story into the emotional stakes of the night and that also sets us in a place, right? So we really attempted to do that story in the first chapter of the series to, to kind of understand what happens next. Um, and so just, you know, ve very briefly, um, what, you know, listen to the podcast, I won't spoil too much for you, but what happens after is that there's a, th a theory that's developed, that the go Mexican government develops that we now know becomes a cover up for what actually happened that night and where the young men were. And two years out, this was in 2014, by 2016, so the case is shut down. The investigators are kicked out of Mexico and out of the country. And um, this is when the lawyers of these families reach out to my partner, Kate Doyle. And I had this lovely clip for all of you, but Eric said that you might want to hear more from me. So I also encourage you to come to the panel. I'll be with Ear Hustle at 345, and you can learn more. Um, but basically, this is where my, my, my co-producer and co-reporter, Kate Doyle, gets roped in. The lawyers reach out to her because they're saying that these young men were taken by these like local criminals, right? And they ask Kate Doyle to basically FOIA the US government for anything that, that she might find, not only about this case, but about this group of criminals named Guerreros Unidos. It turns out that her, along with other investigators, figure out that this is not just like a local crime group, but a transnational drug cartel connected to a heroin drug trafficking operation out of Aurora, Illinois, connected to, which is a suburb outside of Chicago, um, to Iguala Guerrero. So, you know, when we talk about local reporting and local stories and being in it kind of for the long game and not just the daily news, this is just a deep example of how in order to understand, you know, a city like Aurora, Illinois, or even Chicago at the local level, you have to go beyond US borders. And in order to understand a phenomenon like forced disappearance, now going on 100,000 and, and counting in Mexico, um, all since 2006, since the Merida initiatives, for those of you wonks out there, which is basically US drug policy, in order to understand forced disappearance in Mexico, you have to look to the US. And in this case, these two cities fully connected by what our investigation leads us to is these buses, right? Um, so the clip I was going to play for you that you'll listen to the podcast is of a retired DEA agent who was actually investigating Guerreros Unidos in Chicago. And he talks about opening Time magazine, reading about the theory, which we now know is a cover up, that was covered all over the press and saying they have it wrong. They have to look at the buses. Why aren't they looking at the buses? So this is where we kind of come in to pull the leads. And in 2018, um, 2019 actually, but in 2018, a new president is, you know, a new person is campaigning for president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, AMLO, some of you may have heard of him, and he basically campaigns on the promise that he will get to the truth of what happened to these 43 students. Um, our investigation leaves off in September, I think of 2020, our investigation leaves off with the lead prosecutor basically, you know, um, busting down the veneer of impunity in Mexico and getting to the truth. Um, and he is now in exile in Washington, D.C. for the second time, once in 2016 and now in 2022 of last year. The investigation is in shambles and a lot of the leads that we now know are real point to the military. So I'm here to urge you that um, I know some of you that have heard of Ayotzinapa, you will know that this is a case covered by everybody. There's Ayotzinapa fatigue in Mexico. I'm here to take some out that you out of that fatigue and also tell you that this story is 
not only connected to the phenomena of, of forced disappearance in Mexico, it's connected to Pegasus. The mastermind of the, the cover-up is now living in Israel, and it's connected to our U.S. policy um, of militarizing Mexico, basically, and criminalizing that is leading to this phenomenon of forced disappearance. Um, so these 43 families, uh, they talk about Ayotzinapa, this case being a watershed moment in Mexico, that until this point, um, Mexico saw the phenomenon as forced disappearance as there was no system in place, not even to you know go and say this happened to me. It was like, oh, he went to al otro lado to the other side. Who knows? They, you know, who knows what happened? But after this case, it's this watershed moment where we get to this number of 100,000 in recent years, right? So as a reporter, I want to play you one one more clip. It's four minutes. That was fast. Good job, Eric. Sure. Um, uh, this final clip, we follow one family, um, which is also s s a whole panel discussion. How do you follow one family when there's 43 families? But we follow the family of Doña Cristina Bautista Salvador, who was a, si a single mom. It's a household of three women, Benjamin, her son, who disappeared. And you know, when you we start to cover forced disappearance, and you do you do radio, you have this saying called "Show me, don't tell me." Right? We've all heard this in radio. It's like a trope. But how do you do that when you're covering something as, as intense as forced disappearance? Um, and so in that, I want to play you this final clip of what, what it meant for me. I knew I wanted to end the series on the mother, on Doña Cristi. Um, but I didn't want to end on her crying, frankly. And this is often the task reporters, especially radar reporters, are set on. Get the emotional tape. Get your sources to be super vulnerable. and. You kind of take from them. And if they cry, then you've kind of done your job for the day. And I was just so adamant that I did not want to end um, the series on that note. I wanted the audience and the listeners to be disturbed and to be moved. And um, this is how the series ends. The next day, before we leave, Kate and I sit down with Doña Cristi in Benjamin's room and struggle to pose our questions. She tells Kate and me about a dream she had. In a grand city, there's this house with an open door, and she walks in. A woman in a rebozo, a shawl, greets her. I want to ask you for a favor. In the middle of the room, there's someone sleeping who's covered with a blanket. She tells me, they left me to take care of him. He lost his memory. Can you watch him? Yes. Who is it? Then he gets up. My son. Mi hijo. Me dice, mami, escuché tu voz, dice. Me encontraste. You found me. Look at how they hit me. That's why I'm pretending I can't remember. But I heard your voice, mommy. And I just hugged him. And I tell him, Benja, let's go. But when I turn back to him, Desperté. I woke up and didn't see him, but for a moment I felt joy. I got to see my son. you all of us all of you to listen we also did a six-part series called Después de Ayotzinapa we partnered with Adonde Media um, to do a, a version that was more true to local Mex to a local Mexican audience to a Latin American audience to a Spanish-speaking audience around the world thank you so much <laughs>